Good morning. This week, world leaders, philanthropic leaders, and climate thinkers gathered in New York City to discuss not only the future of the UN, but a reboot of climate positioning around the world. Kevin, I did see you in New York. I saw um, you there too. How was your week and any, any highlights? Well, I had just a two-day climate week, so it was a climate sub-week for me. I think you lasted a little bit longer. But uh, yeah, look, there's still an active discussion going on. Uh, there's a lot of, of new framing, I think, talking more about the energy components than the climate priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, but the discussion is still very much an active one. Three things I heard about while I were there were affordability, mm -hmm. international supply chains, and the intersection of climate and trade, all of which you and I have talked about here on Energy Shots in the last few weeks. And intend to do again. <laughs> yes, again and again. Um, of course, everyone is there for the UN General Assembly. Yes. Right? We've got world leaders. You know, you see them crossing the street as you're walking around Midtown. Um, the president gave a speech that I think keen observers should watch. It was an aggressive, but I thought clear articulation of his views on, multi on internationalism, on pluralism, and on the United Nations. Did you catch the speech? I not only caught the speech, I devoted the next 24 hours to writing a report on it because I agree with you. I thought it was incredibly important. It was an energy speech, it was a climate speech. Yeah. It was probably not the kind of climate speech that the organizers of Climate Week anticipated when they started the event in 2009. <laughs> but I think it was, as you say, it was very important for articulating the president's worldview. It was an anti-globalist worldview, mm -hmm. uh, and it linked a sort of the, the thinking on climate change and trade. Essentially, the president said, among other things, the nations that follow the rules are the nations that lose. Join us in not following the rules which is a, a very interesting perspective to get from an American president, given the rules-based order, shifting into an era of power as it appears to be doing. Right, and, um, and of course, like as we talked about, maybe shifting the rules changes the wind conditions of the game, but that's an, I think, for you know, another day and another year. There was something the president said that really stood out to me. We've got the quote here on the wall. You know, we have, I won't do my Trump impression. You know, we have it. <laughs> Viewers, you missed out, go on. We have an expression, drill, baby, drill, and that's what we're doing. The president in this context was talking about energy abundance, yes, about lowering costs, and about taking a forward stance, on, you know, not worrying about climate change and focusing on fossil fuels as the traditional energy sources, which have made countries rich and, and allowed the world to prosper. He used a specific example of the North Sea. Uh, talking as he did when he was in the UK uh, to Prime Minister Keir Starmer, uh, where he said, you know, you should stop with wind and drill more in the North Sea. He made that point again in his speech, among other things. Now, of course, that wasn't the only bit of information we've got. Now, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today was, are we drill baby drilling? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. So let's look at this chart here. You have the Baker Hughes rig count of U.S. land rigs starting in the first week uh, prior to uh, the inauguration, so the week through the 17th of January. The rig count rises and then begins to fall, and it's now down, down, if you look at sort of from peak to trough, down 9% from this peak up here uh, to the trough down here, uh, a fairly significant rig count reduction and it happens to coincide with the green line, which is the WTI front month futures closing price, which but for the spike in the war, which we have discussed in mm -hmm. past episodes, is also down. You're looking at roughly a 19 percent reduction uh, from the sort of the, the peak here, again, the week through the 17th inauguration. Mm -hmm. uh, and what you have is a very high correlation. When oil prices fall, rig counts slow. Uh, and uh, the, so there, there's a challenging proposition here. First of all, the rig count isn't the only thing that matters when it comes to production, right. uh, but it does matter when it comes to future production. Mm. Uh, and even if you have more horsepower, better technology, uh, when rig counts fall, production tends to flatten and decline. Now, the, this shows the sort of the um, dichotomy that we've worked with under the entire Trump administration. The president wants low oil prices, but higher prices tend to favor production and an expansion of production in the United States. More or less correct? Do you hang out with supply curves a lot? <laughs> Do you hang out with supply curves a lot? You don't see a lot of downward sloping uh, supply curves. Right. Right. But the president and uh, his administration have a proposition that they've laid out. They've mooted the notion in an executive order of unleashing prosperity through deregulation. Yeah. And so the idea is that you could have a, a lower price deck and still derive significant profits at that lower price deck because you've alleviated regulatory burdens borne by industry. Lower price, higher volume. 
and the everybody's happy, win, win, win. Right. Uh, on the other hand, the, the challenge is that when you look at what actually comes out, take price times volume and you get implied revenues. So we're using the same time frame, uh, same price deck, and now we're applying the EIA's weekly crude production series to it and multiplying by the essentially the whole year. And what you have is from, again, that the week through the 17th through the week through the 19th, which is the last week mm -hmm. of available rig count data, the Baker Hughes folks put out their data on Friday. It'll be out this afternoon. But for those watching right now, we still don't have it yet because yep. they, they don't move it up for us. Uh, in any case, it's, it's about a $72 billion annualized impact in that price reduction. Mm. Uh, and that's, that's quite a lot to see uh, if you're trying to put money to work, put rigs to work, Put uh, it, it essentially put production forward right. uh, by by investing in the in the upstream. Uh, now the president, just one thing to say about this, you'll probably guess if what I'm about to say sounds like I'm not running and never should run for elective office. You're correct, uh, but here we are uh, talking economics versus politics. Yes, in our economy, which is I don't this is not an insult, but just a fact. We are a low marginal propensity to save economy. Mm. And what that means is that you get a bigger multiplier from investment, more juice at the wellhead uh, from higher prices than you might get from savings at the service island. Mm. But that doesn't work for retail politics. Low prices are very popular with people who vote. Right. Uh, high prices are much more popular with people who drill. Yes. Uh, and uh, there was recently some input we got from people who drill. Yes. Uh, so for those of you who read the Dallas Fed Energy Survey, which is quarterly, uh, it's great information. We recommend it highly. This is a chart that shows uh, one of the questions. They have additional questions they ask every quarter in, a, in addition to the, the market conditions and the baselines that they always discuss. And one of the questions they asked E&P company executives in their survey set was, what, what do you think you got in the way of regulatory relief on a price per barrel basis? So estimate the impact of regulation in Trump 2.0 on a price per barrel basis. And the majority, nearly 60% of both the large and the small E&P companies in the population said, well, you know, um, probably somewhere less than a dollar, up to a dollar per barrel of savings. A smaller number said it might be $2 per barrel of savings. Uh, and there were a few uh, who said it might be as much as $5 a barrel of savings, which is quite significant. Mm. However, 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 the price reduction is somewhere between $14 and $15 a barrel, depending on how you count on the WTI closing price that we looked at. Right. And here's where it gets complicated. What matters for a lot of executives is not the regulatory savings they will bear in the future, they will gain in the future, but the cash they have on hand now. Right. A lot of those drilling decisions reflect the cash money they have in their pockets, not the regulatory savings they might be able to book. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that that means that even if you did have very significant regulatory savings, and maybe this is lagging, maybe we will see with the endangerment finding and other regulatory changes that are, right. are still pending, that if they did this survey again in a year, the numbers would be much closer to the delta we've seen in prices. Uh, but they're not there yet, and they probably aren't likely to think about that because it takes actual money. Well, and then this is, I mean, well. this is a factor of 10, right? If, if the deregulatory actions that the administration has taken cuts off a dollar or even up to $2 of price difference, that's not going to match the $20 that the president probably wants to achieve in terms of what the oil price should be, right? I think they like the lower prices that we're seeing right now. They're bragging about them at the UN General Assembly. They are. And it's actually a significant part of the disinflationary impact we've discussed in past episodes is motor fuels savings. Mm -hmm. I think who wants to pay higher prices for gasoline? I see no hands. Let the record reflect no hands. Uh, on the other hand, it does create challenges. It's early days. You know, yeah. it would be great is if the Dallas Fed would ask this question again in a year. Uh, but, you know, there are other things to discuss when it comes to energy topics. Uh, other things that were discussed during Energy and Climate Week up in yep. New York. Uh, take us take us into what you've been talking about and thinking about, Joseph. Of course, yeah, I mentioned three things that I heard a lot about uh, in New York Climate Week earlier. Conspicuously left off the list was artificial intelligence. I spent a lot of my time thinking and meeting with folks about AI, uh, what, is, what are the implications of data centers for energy demand in the United States, and in advance of uh, the event, uh, or in advance of the week, I published a paper Monday morning thinking a little bit about what are the applications of AI to the energy system, and how might we use AI to improve reliability, improve costs, 
improve the ability of the electricity system in particular to grow supply. Um, and so I spent several times, several speaking events and other things kind of talking about that paper. Um, the one thing I wanted to talk to you about today that springs from that paper is um, a little bit of thinking about what, you know, energy intensity of the economy. So here's the basic picture. AI has great promise. By improving labor productivity, we think it can help restore economic growth to levels we last saw in the 1990s, maybe even the levels we saw in the post-war boom of the 1950s and 60s. That would do a lot for the United States. It would help resolve our budget deficit issues. Uh, normally when we have that kind of growth, we have tight labor markets, might even help address some of the tough politics around populism and disaffection that we have in the country today. But of course, that raises issues when you're at an energy and climate event. Because historically, booms in economic growth have accompanied booms in energy demand. Mm -hmm. And so one of the big questions is how does energy intensity of that boom, the BTUs per dollar GDP, an event, a, a number we've looked at on this in the show before, going to change if we get the boom that we want to see. And so um, rather than show a forecast of that issue, what I'm showing here is the in energy intensity, 1,000 BTU per dollar of GDP in the United States. Uh, empirically, this is from uh, 2005 to uh, 2025, and it's falling um, as the economy gets more efficient and digital parts of the economy grow at 2.2% per year. That's a pretty significant clip. Can I ask a question, though? Yes, sir. There are some other things that probably happened during that time frame, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we did become more efficient. We computed more. We did a lot more services and less manufacturing as well. Correct. We deindustrialized. Yes. Hmm. So, and, and then what we look at here, a good point, is the forecast that comes from the EIA of mm -hmm. what uh, energy intensity will continue to be in the future. And they see actually that uh, the fall in energy intensity slowing down a little bit to 1.9 per year, uh, percentage points per year, um, and getting smooth because it's a forecast. But the big question that you raise, Kevin, is how is this going to change over time? Because I think they've got two factors which are gonna work against each other. On the one hand, the economy is getting more and more digital with the AI revolution. Which is energy intensive. Um, sort of energy so, intensive? No, historically it hasn't been. I mean, okay. you're going to use a lot of AI, for, a lot of data center, a lot of energy for data centers, okay. but you're probably going to save a lot of energy in other places having a more efficient economy. So it could be a wash. So it could be largely a wash. But okay. if we have a reshoring of manufacturing, if these other national goals start coming into um, Realization. That's more energy intensive. That will definitely be more energy intensive. And so one of the big questions that we're going to be facing and we're going to be working on as a research topic over the next year is what is the envelope around this forecast? Do you have a Sharpie? Can you? <laughs> Didn't say that. No nope. Sharpie. Okay. Um, but like one of the things I think we'll, we'll want to address and one of the things we talked about a lot, and I've talked to the best energy modelers in the world, and no one knows what the sign of expectation should be. Mm -hmm. Do we expect things to go as they as they have been going, or should we expect the, the uh, energy economy of the United States to get more or less energy intense? And it, the, the, that's an enormous question for what our strategy needs to be around how much energy we're going to need in a decade hence. Well, so you've, you've done something I love. Thank you. You've given us a ratio, a numerator and a denominator. Right. And you've discussed both parts, right? Mm -hmm. Not just the energy consumption of the economy, but yes. also the composition of GDP. Oh, totally. And, and people miss this, right? So like we get, you know, with, there's so much conversation around the electricity needs of data centers. But if you restore, if, if data centers and the use of AI increase GDP growth by a point or a point and a half, as like reasonable forecasts show, that's going to have energy implications throughout the economy. It's not just the data centers themselves. And I can throw in more wild cards, which we'll have to come back to in our next episode. Mm -hmm. But here's just one of them. Let me deal yeah. the cards. I don't have all the cards, but now you have one more card that I'm about to give you, which is that we have a heavily financialized economy emerging during this period. Yep. Right? A lot more services, a lot more financial services. Also, we had monetary policy juicing up those financial services, right. swelling the denominator mm -hmm. at a time when we were shrinking the numerator yep. uh, with some offshoring. So if we get to a point where we have a more metal in the ground, people in factories economy uh, that might be less receptive to some of the juicing uh, yep. and also more emissions, we might see 
Again, we might need a Sharpie or at least a different slope yes. uh, to this line. But that, I think, a topic for your paper and, and more work in the future, yes? The question is, which way, where in that band do we find ourselves in the future, you Kevin? You do have a Sharpie. <laughs> well, there we go. Colleagues, thank you for joining us today on this Energy of Ep Energy Shots. Kevin, it's always a pleasure. Yeah. We're wishing you an energetic day. We'll see you on the next one.